Okay. Good evening, everybody. Okay. Uh, today we'll talk about RGI, which is probably solid impact. Um, probably you're aware that OGI uh, is uh, driven and standardized by the organization called OGI Alliance. And uh, uh, as part of it, there are three expert groups where different aspects of the technology are discussed in more details and so those expert groups uh, in those expert groups are top experts in that, in that technology um, and uh, they meet a couple of times per year so this week Software AG hosts such a uh, meeting and uh, we have a chance to meet with uh, these experts and in particular with BJ who is a CTO in OJ Alliance and he will start with integration for AGI this evening. Uh, and of course, after this presentation, there will be Q&A, so you will have a chance to ask your questions about this and uh, about any topics in the area. So, BJ? Uh, by the way, can you hear me well? Do you need a microphone? Uh, anyway. Okay. BJ? Okay. You. All right, thank you so much for coming tonight. Hopefully uh, you learned some good stuff about OSGI. Who here has heard of OSGI? That's ah, pretty good. Very good. So what do you think OSGI is? Any module system. Module system, oh. Right. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about a bit what OSGI is. So the first thing is that OSGI is a group of people, a group of companies that are working to build a standard, right? So OSGI is a consortium of companies like Software AG, who's our host today, and other companies like IBM where I work, Adobe is there, Liferay is there, there's a lot of companies involved. We also have companies from other spaces like NTT is here. So people are using OSGI in many contexts. And we come together in a, as a group to advance the standard and add new features to it. So I'm going to spend a bit of time today talking about uh, OSGI itself, the alliance, and about the technology just so you guys have a sort of a high level understanding of what, uh, what we mean when we talk about OSGI. Uh, we also asked who has heard of the Java platform module system in Java 9. Okay, so we have a nice presentation later from Todor of Software AG that's going to compare and contrast to what OSGI is relative to what the Java platform module system is. He'll give you some opinions on that. Um, so OSGI has been around for a while, right? So Java 9 and, and JPMS are new, but we've been at this for 18 years now. So we've learned a lot, we know a lot, and it's basically been a useful and functional standard for doing modularity in Java for 18 years, right? Which is why a lot of companies, big companies, use it to do important software. Um, and one of the key values of OSGI is it works on every Java since about Java 1.2. It doesn't didn't require somebody to go reinvent new module info files or keywords, right? It, it builds upon the, the, the key secret sauce in Java, which is dynamic class loading. Right? With class loaders in Java, many things can be done, including a module system like OSGI. So we've been working at this for a while. Release one was in 2000. It was very simple. It was just the core framework and a few small services, and, and over the many years we've continued to enhance the framework, adding new features and support. In release three, it became the underpinnings of Eclipse. So if you use the Eclipse IDE at all, that's all OSGI underneath. Um, and uh, release six is our current release. We've just finished release seven, and in fact, uh, by this time next week, it'll be published and available so you can download the spec if you want a PDF. We're going to have a new HTML version of the spec, so you can read it as HTML pages. And we'll also have all the JAR files in Maven Central. So what is OSGI at an architectural level, right? So module system, right? Everyone thinks of OSGI as a module system. That's, of course, an important block, building block, but it's not all that is OSGI, right? So you can see we basically have you know, the classic layer cake architecture here. And we'll talk about the different pieces, right? So obviously everyone's got an operating system and a Java virtual machine. So on top of that, 
OSHA has this concept of an execution environment, which is more important in the old days when we had J2ME and J2SC and J2EE. Um, nowadays it's less of an issue, but we still need to know what is Java, right? especially with Java 9 and all the different modules one can put in or out. right? Uh, I need to know what Java is. So we have to wait, have a way to express a bundle uh, 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 modules dependency of the underlying platform of Java. Um, on top of that, we have the module layer. So this is where OSGI is, where most people know OSGI is doing, right? It's creating modularity. It's giving a class loader to a bundle so he can control which classes he shares and which classes he consumes with other bundles. And of course, what details are private. Um, we have a life cycle. So on top of the concept of modules, we need the ability to manage those modules. We have to be able to install them in the framework. We have to be able to update them and uninstall them. And this can be done dynamically in a running system, or it can just be done in advance. Some systems don't need dynamics at runtime, but it's a very powerful tool as a developer to be able to update as you fix your bundle and test it and debug it. So that's very important. And of course, all of those things are nice, but until you can actually share objects between your bundles, they're just things living on their own, right? So services is the key other piece that most people don't really think of when they think of OSJ, at least think of modules, but you need the ability for modules to interact in a meaningful way, and that's what the OSJ service layer provides. And of course security. Some people need job security. Most people hate security because it just gets in your way. It's a thing you have to deal with as a programmer, but uh, it's there if you need it. Most people don't, don't even care about it. So, I guess the important question here is, what do we mean when we talk about modularity? Why do we want modularity? What does it do for us? Uh, and so basically, modularity is about trying to reduce complexity. Right? In the old days, we just take all of our code and write some C methods, and we'd go call, 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 and good luck if you wanted to change something because you had no idea who you used what and where and why. And so it was a challenging thing. So basically, by putting modularity around things, we can reduce complexity by having a layer encapsulation and understanding where things are related to each other so we know what we can change and, and how it will affect the system. So at the beginning of time, we had functions, right? So who's written some C code here? Uh, look at you guys. The honor the old guys have. Guess what we learned in college, but you know. So back in the old days, right, you wrote a bunch of functions and Hopefully you didn't choose the same function name as some other person that you're trying to link into your program because you both would collide with each other trying to share the same function name. So it's a very, it's a small bit of encapsulation, but you're just encapsulating some code and there's still opportunity for collisions. So the next big advancement that we came up with in the computer science space was objects, right? So if you ask you know, somebody 20, 30 years ago, objects were scary and foreign, but pretty much everyone here has probably learned object-oriented programming in school, right? You use you know, some Java in college and other similar languages, small talk maybe. And so objects gives you the next higher level of encapsulation, right? Because you begin to wrap some encapsulation around data. You can hide data. Where C, you couldn't, right? They were just, they were just uh, statics or something, right? You, you, you couldn't really hide your data. Now with object-oriented, you can hide your data. And you can also hide your methods, right? Because you can have private methods. And so if you want to re-engineer the interior of your object by changing the, the private methods, sure, because no one else can really depend upon them. Java introduced packages, right? So when Java came out, that was another add on top of classes. So they weren't just loose classes, they were organized in packages. And so that gave us a little bit of benefit. Packages themselves aren't really a first class object in Java, but they do give us some ability to have sort of package private or default access methods and fields. So I can write a couple of classes that can work with each other through package private methods and fields, but other packages are hidden away from that. So it gives me that level of encapsulation. So then the next thing is bundles, right? This is what OSGI brings and to some degree what JPMS brings. It's the next grouping of encapsulation. So we take packages now and we put packages in a module or a bundle and we can now encapsulate packages. So not only can a package have classes that are private to the package, a bundle can have packages that are private to the bundle. 
So that's another very powerful thing. It means I don't necessarily have to expose all of the details of my bundle to some other bundle. I can choose what packages are important to share. What is the API? What is the public contract of my bundle? I can say these packages are the public contract of my bundle, and these packages are mine, my implementation detail. You can't touch them, and I'm, I can change them without hurting you. So we end up with that, right? And so the, the concept of the colors here basically read th things that I import in the white, things that are private to me in the gray, and then things that I export. Those are the things I want to share with other people. Right? So a bundle, much like a package in a class, will have different flavors. You'll use types from other bundles, you'll have types you use internally, and then you'll have types you'll share with other bundles. Right, and so in order to do this, of course, one needs some metadata to describe it, right? And so one of the things that OSGI does is it defines how you can tell the system, for my bundle, these are the packages that I import, these are the packages that I export, and of course, all that's left over is just my implementation details. And so when you have that level of metadata, you can reason about a system. What happens if I change this bundle for another bundle? Because I know what his contract is, what he exports, and I know what other bundles imports, I can tell you if the system will still work or not. And with MSGI, we have versioning on these things too. So with semantic versioning, who here has heard of se semantic versioning? Okay, so that's good. So with semantic versioning, we have rules about what the version numbers mean. Major, minor, micro, right? If you change the major version, that means you're breaking all your clients. Everyone better get out there. Uh, computers and reprogram to the new API. But if I change the minor version, I'm just adding some new features in a backwards compatible manner, and micro versions are mostly just bug fixes. But with this information about what I import, what I export, and versioning, I can do some really powerful reasoning about my system. I can know what can be changed without hurting other people. And so this gives us the ability to understand the type coupling in the system. And it lets us have alternate implementations, right? Because I can substitute one package, a bundle providing package A, for a different bundle providing package A, because they're equivalent. It's the same package name at a semantically, uh, 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 ver a version that's semantically equivalent, right? I know it's safe to do that. And so it's easy then to swap out implementations. Do I want the small, lightweight implementation, or I need the robust, fully scalable implementation, right? Depending upon my needs in any given deployment of a system, it might make sense to use one or the other. You need the debug version of something or the production version of something. It gives you a lot of ability to swap things in and out of your system. But type coupling is necessary, but it's often not sufficient to build a system because it's sort of nice for me to have a class I can access your class, but I, I can't really do anything with that. I need objects, right? So normally I would have objects that I need. I need to construct an object. I need to get objects. So even though a provider might have an object, if I'm going to consume that object, I need to get it from the other bundle. How do I do that? And so typically, in order to support that, we have the concept of API bundles. Right? So we've all written Java code here. We've all written an interface, and then we've implemented that interface. And then when somebody else is using the object, how do they refer to it? By the interface. Right? Because I can, multi I can implement that interface many different times, and I've abstracted away the consumer of the object from the implementation details. He doesn't have to know the actual implementation class. He just has to have an object that implements an interface that he knows. Right? So in OSGI, we can put that interface in an exported package. And then both the provider bundle, the guy who's implementing the interface, can implement it because he imports the package, right? And his implementation class then is a private detail of his bundle. And the same thing on the consumer side. He imports the same API package. So they're both type compatible because they share the same interface class. So the object implemented by the provider can be cast to the type of the interface by the consumer. But then, of course, you have the problem about how does the consumer get that object? Right? He needs an instance of that object of that interface. And that's the challenge, right? 
So what would you, how would you get another object today? Right, the default thing to do, of course, is we would want to do new. Right? And everyone who's written Java has done new on a, on a class to get an object of an instance. But of course, in order to new on something, you need to know the class name. So if the client wants an object, he has to know the implementation type. He has to have access to the implementation type. So how is the implementation type encapsulated away? And so that's when, you know, so then the next invention of Java was factories. So, okay, I don't need to know the details, but I'll ask the factory. And the factory knows the details. But, of course, you just pushed over the details a little bit. Because now the factory, of course, is coupled to the implementation object. And, of course, a version of control is popular, too. People, you probably heard of Spring. Maybe you've written some Spring code, right? So uh, in the old days in Spring, before they had annotations, we had this God XML file. So there was this one... XML file that knew everything about the universe. He knew all of the objects and where they had to go. Right? And so he was God, but he had to know every implementation detail about everybody because he had all these class names in him. And if you refactored something, you know, heaven help you, you had to go figure out how to edit that XML file because the refactoring in your ID didn't help at all. And so the, uh, the, the real answer here is what we need is a broker. <coughs> With a guy who, who creates, who is the provider of the object, he creates the object himself, and he knows his own implementation details, and he registers it with a broker under the interface type. And then whoever needs it can go to the broker and say, hey, dear broker, I need an object that implements this interface. Oh, here you go. And so we've been, both the provider and the consumer are abstracted away from each other's implementation details. There's just a broker in the middle matching them up. And so in OSGI, this is what we call the service model. So if you've written any OSGI code, you probably encourage services and registering services. And so what happens is if you want to be the database service, you might implement your database interface class. And then you'll take that object and you'll register it with OSGI in the service registry. And then anybody else who wants to get it can go ask the service registry, hey, I need an object that implements the database interface. Here you go. And so both parties don't know about each other a priori. But all they have to know about is that interface type that they're implementing. And then they can both work with the broker to share the object. And so I can replace one without affecting the other. Right? I can put a new implementation in my service, or I can add new clients of the service, and they don't, neither has to know of the other. They just have to share the common interface type. So in, in OSGI, we, we've been calling these microservices long before that term was co-opted by the uh, current RESTy type microservice world with Docker containers and whatnot. But uh, so basically, our, our service model in OSGI is a broker model, right? So there's the ability for each party to be separated from each other. It's a publish, find, and bind model. So and there's full notification, so people can observe the actions of the system. If you're looking for a service, you can listen to it being registered, and then you can go get it. And all of this stuff is fully um, uh, introspective, so the system can know who's using what service, and you can do diagnostics on it, and it's all it's quite powerful. So that's the basics at a very high level overview of what OSGI is, right? So we have modularity, which is giving us encapsulation of types. We have a lifecycle model that lets us manipulate those bundles, install them, start them, stop them. And we have a service model that lets them encapsulate, it, it, it cooperate, collaborate together in a model that says, I don't need to know any implementation details about you using the broker. Um, so you can, if you want to know more about OSGI, of course, we have our, our website. And you can download the various specifications. And like I said, release 7 is going to be out. Uh, one of the neat new things that we did that Ray engineered for us, Ray Roger and Lifery, was we now have uh, an HTML version. So you no longer have to download a five megabyte PDF to learn something. It's, uh, it's on the web and you'll be able to find it with Google, hopefully, once it gets all nicely indexed. So I encourage you to go check that out and check out the OSJ website. As expert groups, right, we're, as I mentioned, we're meeting here this week and we're talking about things and we've got most of the stuff done in release seven. We still have some, a bit more work to do on the enterprise spec, but we're also beginning to look at what happens next, what's in release eight. And so as an expert group, we are working on these design things. We have requirement documents, we call RFPs, and we have design documents, we call RFCs. And these are us talking to each other in the expert groups. But we, we talk to each other through this GitHub repository. 
So if you go to GitHub OSGI slash design, you'll see all of our design documents. Sort of this is a live mirror of our Git repo. So if you care or are interested in a particular topic, you can easily follow along, see what's going on. If you have comments or advice, uh, you can feed back to us through our public Bugzilla system. So I encourage you to check out that too. And of course, Bugzilla. Uh, this is where if you have a comment or a complaint or a defect you found in our work, uh, we'd love to hear about it. And so I would encourage you, if you interested in OSGI, if you find it useful, or if you, if you want to see it get better, or you have some ideas from your spec, I would say, you know, by all means, get involved. We are a member-driven company, an all-volunteer army, so if you've got an itch to scratch, we'd love you to come uh, uh, to OSGI and scratch it. So I would uh, encourage you to get involved. So hopefully I gave you a little flavor of what, uh, what OSGI is. So any questions on um, the basics? No? Okay. Can I force a component to die if it doesn't want to die? Well, Java as a system, right, is a set of objects in a shared heap, right? Yeah. So it's hard to force it to do anything, right? Yeah. So there's no magic in OSGI that, that, because it just uses what Java is, right? Mm -hmm. So the real magic is basically just using class loaders to create a model of, of isolation through type visibility restrictions. So on the lower context. Right, I think, I think, in my opinion, is that it's a fundamental design principle of Java that you're not going to get fixed, right? It's, it's not, it's not, Java is not the way it is. Java is a single heap system, and it's hard to, to it's not like a process model on an operating system where you can take some process and take it out. You can't do that in Java easily, right? You can only attempt to coerce it to, and convince it to go away, but a bad actor can't really be gotten rid of. Yeah. Right. So yeah, OSJ has no secret sauce that Java doesn't have. Yeah. Oh, sorry. He was asking, is is there any way to forcibly remove a bad actor, basically, or it's someone now? Yeah. I mean, there I are, think that was your question, right? Yeah. yeah. There are some Java specs that, that deal with this um, scope in in the RTSJ, and and there's the the. Um, respect for isolates, but basically what you have to have there is separate heaps. Yeah. Right. Or, or heaps where you have restrictions on po on pointing uh, between them. And you have to have that because otherwise, you know, you're back with one heap again. You just segment it, but you haven't really separated. So if you have a strong system need for that, there are some choices available to you, but, you know, the challenge will be adapting your code set to work within the restrictions that the environment places to give you the feature of ability to kill things. So yeah. again, it's, these are all engineering trade-offs. Is that some, somehow mitigated, but Eclipse, for example, if you want to unload something, so if it complies, it complies. If it doesn't well, comply. I mean, Eclipse, again, is just vanilla OSGI usage, right? So yeah. an Eclipse plugin is an OSGI bundle that might have some plugin registry information that it participates in the ID, contributes stuff, but it's, it's just Java all running happy in the virtual machine yeah. together. Um, you know, the, the fact that you have that, that there are bundles means you can tell them to stop and tell them to unload. But if they're not going to cooperate with you, there's not much you can do, right? So you, they need to be well behaved. But if they're well behaved, yes, that does work. You can stop a bundle and uninstall it. If something happens, it's considered a bug, so it needs to be fixed and updated. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Any other questions or comments? You guys are good. All right, so I guess we should uh, hand off to our next speaker. Okay. Yeah.